Hello and welcome! In this video, we'll be going over the very basics of the tabletop car combat game, Gaslands. This video was made to help new players get their bearings and also as supplementary material to more of my videos in the future. The video will be timestamped, so you can skip ahead to whichever section you'd like down in the description. In a nutshell, Gaslands is a game of rounds, which are split into gear phases. Each round has six gear phases, starting from gear 1, going through to gear 6. Each vehicle has a current gear, and may activate in each phase that is equal to or lower than that current gear. Vehicles move using movement templates, and may shoot their weapons after each activation. A car in gear 1 only activates in gear phase 1. A car in gear 6 can activate in all of the gear phases. To quote the book, driving fast is good. And speaking of the book, it is the single best resource you could have going into the game. It is gorgeously laid out and has lots of special rules and scenarios for you to work with. At the back of the book you can find some templates which you can print out and glue onto some cardboard and use for playing the game. There are also acrylic templates available online. I got my set from Battle Kiwi. You will also need skid dice, which are custom made for Gaslands. You could also just use the sixes for these along with the conversion chart, but the custom dice do make it easier. I got my ones from North Star Military Figures. You'll also need some standard D6 or six sided dice. I like using the Chessex ones because they're a little bit smaller. The most you'll need at one time is probably 10 of them. Six is a good number to start with. Next up, you'll need your cars. You can use Hot Wheels for this, or Matchbox, or Maisto, whatever's handy. 164 to 172 is the scale you are looking for. Once you're more familiar with the game, you can also convert your vehicles, adding on weapons and paint jobs. The book will also come with these vehicle cards, which can be photocopied right onto cardstock. They are very handy for keeping track of your stats as you play a game. You will also need a playing surface. I would recommend playing at least a 3x3 size table, because any smaller and it can get really cramped. Gaslands does not need all that much terrain, just those four containers can already make for some interesting layouts. You're also going to want some of these race gates. A lot of scenarios in the book will use these gates, so it's very handy to have a set of them. They only need to be the size of a long movement template, so you can also make your own. Before we have a look at the rules proper, let's have a look at the vehicles and what goes into them. Looking at the vehicle card, some of these stats will not change across the game. For this specific game, a performance car is always a performance car. It'll always have a max gear of 6, a handling of 4, and a hull rating of 8. These stats will stay the same unless something specifically changes them. Some other stats though will change a lot across one game. Hazards, hull points, and current gear will change from turn to turn depending on the actions of the car. We'll be keeping track of these stats here on the screen using these icons. We are now headed into the structure of a Gaslands round, so let's break down what it takes to finish an activation. Now as we know, each round is made up of 6 gear phases in which each car has a chance to activate once. Within each activation, there are three further steps. The first step is often the most busy, it is the movement step, and we'll be having a look at that first. All of today's demonstrations will be done by the Circle Tracker, which is a performance car. A big part of Gaslands is the use of the movement templates, and selecting and using a template will be the very first thing you do in the movement step. When selecting templates, it is important to remember the you touch it, you use it rule. Once you pick up a template, you cannot put it back down, you have to use it. Once you have committed to your choice of template, you may now lay it down in front of the vehicle. The side with the name on it should be touching the vehicle, and make sure everything is lined up with the template centered on the vehicle. The next step will be moving our vehicle to the end of the template. The vehicle is currently at gear 1, and we want to do something about that, so let's cut away for a bit to learn about skid dice. Before finalizing your vehicle's move across a template, you are allowed to roll a number of skid dice. A vehicle can roll a number of skid dice equivalent to the number of its handling value. 
so in our case, the circle tracker would be able to roll 4 skid dice. Each skid dice rolled will give you a result, and you can use those results to do a number of things to your vehicle. Most of the time you will be looking for shift results, as shift results allow you to change gear. A shift result can also cancel out any of the other results in a row. You can also use extra shift results to remove hazards from your vehicle. Overall, they're pretty good to get, and you want them in your rolls most of the time. However, these two other results, spin and slide, are how you get fancy with your driving. They can be occasionally very useful, unlike this other result, which is the hazard result. That's only really something you want to see under really specific circumstances. Knowing all that, we can now rewatch this movement template finalize. What the circle tracker is doing here is not rolling any skid dice. Instead, it has gotten a free shift result for making a trivial move. We are using a medium move template in gear 1, which will have the shift icon next to it. That means the move is trivial, and we get a free shift even if we elect not to roll any skid dice. The circle tracker uses its free shift to shift up one gear. Changing gears will always give you one hazard. It ends the activation on gear 2, ready to activate for the next phase. Rewinding once more, let's see what that activation would have looked like if I had rolled two skid dice for the circle tracker. We end up rolling a skid and a hazard, which will cancel each other out. The trivial shift is still used to gear up one, but we do nothing fancy from the roll in this instance. The move carries on, the circle tracker shifts up, gains one hazard, and is ready for gear two. Now a medium's trait is relatively safe, so you can get away without rolling, but sometimes you end up with a template that does not have any trivial markers on your gear. In this instance, you have to roll your skid dice if you want to shift up. How much you want to roll is entirely up to you, but the more dice you roll, the more likely you are to do quite badly. In this case, the car rolls fine, so it will simply do the hairpin, use one of those dice to shift up, cancel all the hazards with all those extra shifts, and get itself ready for gear 2. Next up, we will be looking at how to reverse. Reversing is only ever done in gear 1, and follows all the standard rules except you're going backwards. You treat the back of the car as if it were the front of the car, and just follow up with the move as you would normally do. It is worth noting that you can use any number of shift results to go up or down any number of gears, so if you need to reverse from gear 1 into a high gear, it is totally doable. We see here now a reversing hairpin. The car has to roll 3 dice because it needs one of those shift results to be able to go into gear 2. Remember that if you can't shift up to the next gear, you will not be able to activate for the rest of the round. The circle tracker uses that one shift to shift up, leaving it ready for gear 2. Note that it has taken a hazard from gearing up because it did not have any extra shifts to cancel out that hazard with. Up next we'll be looking at slide results and how to resolve them. Slides are one of the results of the skid dice, and they can make some interesting changes to the way your car moves. You can always cancel a slide result with a shift result, but sometimes you may just want to keep them around. In this case, we have ended up with a slide result and two hazard results. So off the bat, the car will get two hazards just from the roll. So what happens now is we put down the slide template, slot it into that little divot on the template, which should be on all the other templates, and then move the car so it's perpendicular to the top end of the slide. The circle tracker ends up with three hazards because each slide result also gives you one hazard. You also cannot use shift results to cancel hazards from a resolved slide. We'll now flip that same hairpin template so we can show you how a spin works. A spin works almost exactly like a slide in terms of the rolling. You can again cancel out these results with any shift result on the roll. In this case, we are canceling that hazard result and keeping that spin result. Just like slides, they will give you one hazard each for each uncancelled spin dice. Unlike slides, you will resolve the move as normal, getting into your standard final position. But before you finalize, you will now have the opportunity to pivot your vehicle 90 degrees in either direction away from its initial facing. 
This can be a very handy way to get right into the position you need or to turn a long straight into a sharp corner. For this next one, we will resolve both a slide and a spin on the same roll. Doing that same hairpin, we roll our dice. And would you look at that? We end up with a slide and a spin and a hazard. So there's no way out of this particular roll. To resolve the slide and the spin, you put down the slide template first. You move the car into the final position. And before you settle, you have the opportunity to pivot your car in either direction 90 degrees. A result like that will give you a bunch of hazard tokens though and is liable to send you colliding into the terrain. And speaking of which, next up we are going to deal with the rules around collisions, both with terrain and with vehicles. In a nutshell, collisions in gas lands will happen when a vehicle's movement is interrupted by obstructions. Obstructions can be scenery or other vehicles. Once a collision is confirmed, both parties will declare reactions. A reaction may either be a smash attack or an evade. If a vehicle resolves one of those reactions, it cannot do the other. When a vehicle is in a collision with a scenery piece, it will still have both these options, but it will probably just want to evade, since you can't smash attack scenery. Each smash attack rolls a number of dice depending on the nature of the collision, and each dice will generate a hit if it rolls a 4 or higher. If the dice rolls a 6, it generates 2 hits instead. If a vehicle has any uncancelled hits and it has declared an evade as a reaction, it may roll a number of dice equivalent to its current gear. Each 6 it rolls will remove 1 hit. Being involved in a collision will automatically get you 2 hazard tokens, unless both participants evade, in which case they both gain 1 hazard token. Finally, if a vehicle starts its activation in contact with an obstruction, it is distracted and cannot fire for that activation, but it is also obliged to ignore the obstruction it is currently in contact with. So if it's touching something at the start of the activation, it can just drive straight through it. A collision is what happens when the movement template sends the vehicle into scenery or into another vehicle. We're going to demonstrate this by driving this car directly into this wreck. The circle tracker will do a medium straight and gear up, with all the movement rules happening before the collision. There are three different kinds of collisions, and collisions with scenery are always head-on collisions. When involved in a collision, a vehicle will always have the choice to either smash attack or evade. Scenery, however, will always smash attack. In a head-on collision, the smash attack dice value will be equal to the current gear of both participating parties. In this case, it is only one dice because Circle Tracker is in gear 1 and scenery is always counted to be gear 0. If you didn't quite get that, don't worry because we are about to drive Circle Tracker into a bunch of other things. The wreck was only a medium-sized obstruction, so now we'll see what happens when we drive into a larger obstruction. The container is one size larger than Circle Tracker, so it gets an additional two dice for its smash attack. If it were two sizes bigger, it would get four dice. The container has done one point of damage to Circle Tracker, and since Circle Tracker has chosen to evade, it gets to make an evade roll. An evade roll is equal to the vehicle's current gear, so just one in Circle Tracker's case. It will only ever succeed on a 6, and it will take away 1 point of damage if it does. It has not though, so Circle Tracker takes 1 point of damage. Vehicles involved in the collision must also take 2 hazards. Next up, we will be driving through this stack of pallets. We'll be calling it a medium-sized destructible obstacle. Destructible obstacles are pretty similar to regular obstacles, but with one key difference, which we will see once we have finished plowing through it. You will resolve the position as normal, stopping the car before it hits final position, and then declaring reactions to the smash attack from the obstacle. The stack of pallets rolls one dice and gets one hit on Circle Tracker. Circle Tracker will evade and fail to, taking one point of damage. The destructible obstacle is then destroyed and then taken off the table. Once it is removed, the vehicle may continue movement down the template. Circle Tracker takes two hazards for being in a smash attack, gears up one, and takes one point of hull damage. 
We now move on to collisions with other vehicles, starting off with the same kind of collision as with obstacles, the head-on collision. A head-on happens when both vehicles collide on their front edge. The value of any smash attacks will be equivalent to the sum total of both vehicles' current gear. In this case, both vehicles are in gear 1, so both of them will roll 2 dice for their smash attacks. Since both of them are making smash attacks, neither of them get to evade. Both vehicles were in a smash attack, so they both take two hazards. We'll be doing the next collision in reverse, which only means we treat the vehicle's back end as its front end. This type of collision is called the T-Bone Collision, and it happens when the point of contact is along either vehicle's side edge. A T-Bone Smash Attack will only roll dice equivalent to the vehicle's current gear. So in this case, Circle Tracker only rolls the one dice. Please ignore that one I rolled, we'll only be resolving the six for this example. The yellow car overboard has declared an evade as its reaction, so it rolls a dice and does not get that six. Even though only one vehicle declared the smash attack, both will still get two hazards. The third kind of vehicle collision is the tailgate, which happens when there is a back edge involved as a point of contact. Tailgate smash attacks are equivalent to the difference of either vehicle's current gear, but in this case, both vehicles will declare an evade as their reaction. No smash attack dice are rolled, and both vehicles come out with one hazard instead of two. If either vehicle had rolled a smash attack, they would have rolled zero dice, because both are in gear one, and one minus one equals zero. And finally, we'll have a look at how a vehicle activates in the movement phase when in contact with another vehicle. Just like other obstructions, you will have to ignore them for that movement phase and drive straight through them. Now that we've covered the movement step, we can move on to the attack step. In a nutshell, if you want to attack something with guns, you first have to make sure it is in range. Once you have confirmed that you are within shooty shooty range, you check the stats of your weapon and roll the number of dice associated with it. The rules for hits are the same as smash attacks. 4 up is 1 hit, 6s are 2 hits. Whatever you're shooting will always be able to evade. Just like smash attacks, they roll their current gear. Unlike smash attacks, you don't have to declare evades here, you can always do it when you're being shot at. But you only ever make one evasion roll at the very end of the attack phase, regardless of how many guns the attacking car has shot at you. When talking about the attack step, the first thing to approach would be the weapon ranges. Weapons use movement templates as their range, so a weapon with a medium range will use a medium movement template. You may move the template side to side as long as you stay parallel to the edge of the vehicle. Try to keep the template as close as you can to the edge while staying parallel. A front mounted weapon may only shoot out of the front edge. If you can get the template over the target, then you can shoot it. Side mounted weapons can shoot out of either side edge of the vehicle, following all the same rules of shooting. Same thing for rear mounted weapons, except they come out of the back edge. Turret mounted and crew fired weapons have a 360 degree arc of fire. This lets them shoot all around the vehicle so long as a template is touching an edge. Whenever a weapon has a double range, that just means you can put together a long and a medium template to determine its final range. We'll now be doing some demonstrations of the actual attack step in action. We'll be taking it from the top of the movement step, using the default handgun that all cars are armed with. For this movement step, the circle tracker will make a medium move forward, and then for its attack step, it will declare one shot with its handgun into the yellow overboard, who is in gear 2. It hits twice, though sixes make two hits. Once the attacking vehicle finishes, the target vehicle can make one evade roll equivalent to their current gear. The overboard is in gear 2, but does not make any saves. The next demonstration will be courtesy of the Rodzilla, which is armed with a turret-mounted flamethrower. It starts with a medium move straight, and then it will shoot its turret-mounted flamethrower at the overboard. A flamethrower uses a large burst template instead of a movement template. It will still follow the same rules for shooting though, so you need to get the overboard underneath the template to be able to shoot it. The overboard falls under the large burst template, so the Rodzilla gets to shoot. Flamethrowers get to roll 6 dice, so we're looking for anything 4 and above, and we score 2 hits. 
Overboard is currently on gear 1, so it only rolls one of its evasion dice. Now we have the cool one, who has a side-mounted heavy machine gun. He's going to drive up using a medium straight, and shoot those side machine guns out from the side of the vehicle. Heavy machine guns have three attack dice, so cool one will make three dice rolls trying to get those fours on overboard. He hits thrice, one doing two damage, so he does a total of four hits. Overboard makes his one save and takes away one. This means Overboard takes a total of three hits from that attack. We'll also be taking a quick overview on dropped weapons just so we get familiar with their rules. We'll also start from the top here. Circle Tracker makes a short straight this time, just for change of pace. And then it will attack with a mine layer. Now, dropped weapons can only be mounted on the back or on the side. And the way they work is you put down their shooting template on the board and you leave them there. When another vehicle drives over this template in the movement phase, that is when you trigger the dropped weapons attack. This mine has four attack dice and we are going to roll them in an attack where you would usually resolve a collision for a vehicle. The overboard gets to finish its movement once it has suffered the attack. It gets to evade as usual even though it messed that up there. That covers the basics of attacking, so now we are on to the final step of the activation, the wipeout step. In a nutshell, the wipeout step is fairly simple. If you have six or more hazard tokens, you proceed to wipe out. First you do a flip check and resolve the flip if you fail. Regardless of whether you flip check or not, you then proceed with the rest of the wipeout. The car will lose control and you will reset to gear one. But you also lose all of your hazard tokens. To illustrate a wipeout check, we will be running the circle tracker who is in gear three. It's loaded with four hazards currently and is taken a medium straight to try and get rid of them. Unfortunately, it has rolled four hazards, which means it goes up to seven hazards after the free shift. It finishes the movement template loaded with all its hazards and will skip the attack step because there is nothing to shoot. At the start of the wipeout check, the first thing you do is a flip check, which is just rolling a dice and hoping it does not come under the current gear. It has rolled under the current gear in this instance, so we will now resolve a flip. In a flip, the vehicle will first take two hits, which cannot be evaded. Then it will be forced into a medium straight, which can send it into a collision. The flip then ends, and we proceed with the rest of the wipeout. When a vehicle wipes out, you remove all of its hazard tokens, but you also set it back to current gear 1. After that, it loses control, and the player clockwise of you can get to pivot the vehicle in any direction. That about covers the basics of Gaslands, but I would still like to touch on one more rule. Some folks would say it's the most important one. The rule of carnage. All this means is that whenever a rule is unclear, choose whichever option results in the most carnage for all concerned. And that will wrap up this video, I do hope it was helpful. I will be making play videos in the future so we can see these rules along with the more advanced ones in the full Gaslands round. If you've enjoyed today's video, hit that like button down low. And if you'd like to see the new ones as they come in, please do subscribe. Until then, that will be me. See you folks next time.